so uh, welcome uh, to the event on uh, the, the EU and um, feminist um, global trade politics. My name is uh, Pola Cebulak. I'm an assistant professor in EU law at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, this event is uh, part of an in focus uh, series that I am co organizing together with uh, my two colleagues, uh, Hannah Mullenhoff and Lara Talsma. And uh, this uh, in focus series is entitled A Feminist EU in the World? Question mark. And uh, we try to look a bit uh, at uh, a potential for a feminist foreign policy for the European Union in uh, different policy areas as well. And today we will be specifically discussing EU's trade policies from a more feminist angle. So uh, welcome especially to all of our attendees. And uh, I uh, wanted to highlight uh, that uh, this is a roundtable debate, so there will be no long presentations with PowerPoints, but uh, rather a series of questions to our uh, panelists. So also all of you in the audience, you are welcome to raise comments and questions at any time uh, through the Q&A function in, uh, in Zoom here. And uh, I wanted to uh, briefly introduce the context of why we organized this event. So we started our, um, our uh, event series with uh, discussing the report for, on a feminist foreign policy for the European Union that was prepared for the European Parliament. And this report focuses especially on security and peacekeeping. And it discusses trade only marginally through the prism of how it's relevant for violent conflicts. And, uh, we will be coming back to this peace and security discussion in our next event in May that will focus on EU's peacekeeping role. But today we wanted to flip the perspective a bit uh, and put trade policy at the center of, um, of our analysis and examine it a bit also through a feminist le lens. So what we want to combine a bit is uh, to combine conceptual and theoretical debates about uh, feminist foreign policy with current developments in EU trade policy and generally the reality of EU trade agreements. So from the academic context, we of course have many debates that link back to definitions of feminism. So whether we focus on equal participation and the rights of men and women in a society, or whether we adopt a rather broader intersectional understanding of feminism as promoting progressive and inclusive, inclusive solutions for any disadvantaged groups. And we also have a sort of, um, as we call it, literature gap or like uh, silences of different debates that on the one hand, we have the debates about international economic law and policy that seem not to conceptualize feminism a lot and to, stated uh, lightly. And on the other hand, we have the debates about uh, feminism and international relations that, as I mentioned already, tend to focus rather on the peace and security dimensions than on trade. So with this event, we're also trying to bridge this gap a little bit. But also we have a lot of current important developments in the policy context. So when it comes to the European Union, I would like to already put on the table a bit the recent uh, policy document of the European Commission from the 18th of February, 2021, that outlines a plan for an open, sustainable and assertive trade policy for the European Union. So this started in a way back in November when several EU member states with the leading role of the Netherlands here called in, through a non-paper for an inclusion of gender equality in the U European Union's trade policy review. So this uh, led to this communication of the European Commission from February this year, uh, which includes gender in two ways. I would say a bit marginal ways. First, it mentions gender on page 22 of this document that has 22 pages. Um, and 
at this stage, the commission points out the need to deepen its analytical and data collection efforts. So it's mainly focusing on gathering more data relating to the effects of trade on gender. And secondly, the European Commission expresses its commitment expresses its commitment to supporting gender initiatives at the level of the WTO. So the World Trade Organization, a multilateral forum. So it's rather delegating uh, those uh, responsibilities at the global level. So this seems at first glance that the commission is paying more of a lip service uh, to gender policy consideration. And in this policy and in this academic context we have today with us, uh, three speakers that, uh, uh, that have experience in both the policy and the academic world. So in earlier debates, we had uh, also the chance to have a member of European Parliament here that already highlighted a lot the problems or the tensions between academic debates and the practical policy considerations of actually implementing them. So I hope we can also pick up a bit on those debates today. So I'm very happy with me to have uh, the three speakers uh, here today uh, that are also scattered across the globe today. So uh, hence our early morning time for European standards because we also, we have Professor Susan Harris-Rimmer joining us uh, from Australia today. Uh, Susan is, uh, yes, <laughs> exactly, try to identify yourself on the screen a bit. Uh, Susan is a professor um, in international law. She's um, also the director of the Griffith University Policy Innovation Hub. And she has experience uh, both working with uh, the UN organizations, uh, the Australian government, and uh, a series of academic publications on, the, on feminist perspectives of inter on international law. Uh, we also have with us uh, Silke Tromar. Silke is a um, senior lecturer in comparative public policy at Manchester University. And she's also part of a collaborative grant project called She Trades, Gendering Global Trade Governance, uh, which relates very closely to the issues we want to discuss today. And last but not least, we have uh, Maya Tasselar with us. Maya works as a trade policy officer responsible for gender issues at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So she can also explain to us a bit more the internal dynamics behind the developments that I just flagged. So I would want to uh, start with a first question a bit about what is at stake here to, um, to all of you. So uh, we mostly perceive trade policy as gender neutral as, and as very much expert driven. And uh, I want to ask what blind spots are created this way. So what blind spots are created either within the EU itself or from the perspective of uh, external partners and also in the global trade policy uh, politics more generally. So maybe we could start actually with, uh, with Maya and then uh, Suzanne and then Silke, if that's fine with you. I would give the word to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paula and uh, colleagues for organizing the event today. Um, well, maybe let me just start by very briefly uh, mentioning uh, that gender equality and women economic empowerment is a uh, general objective of the Dutch uh, International Trade and International Development Corporation agenda. Uh, which means that it is a, a mainstream topic throughout various policy areas. So not just trade policy, but also um, aid for trade programs and uh, trade promotion. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, other policy areas as well. Um, the, ne the Netherlands is a uh, strong proponent of uh, open and rules-based trade system. Uh, as this, of course, to a trading nation as the Netherlands uh, is something uh, of importance. It can uh, generate economic growth, is of importance to our uh, economy and uh, to our employment opportunities. Uh, however, challenges exist. So if you ask what are the blind spots that are created, um, if we don't look at uh, gender inequality and women in economic empowerment, I'd say that, well, we need, to, uh, we need to realize that um, 
not all benefits of trade policy are necessarily distributed equally uh, so that women may struggle to obtain the benefits of trade. Uh, and this is due to uh, existing gender uh, inequalities and gender gaps. So meaning that, for example, women might not be represented in those sectors that are more competitive and that uh, may, be may benefit from, open up, from opening up trade. Um, as consumers, they may uh, be faced with uh, higher tariffs on products that women may consume more than their male counterparts. Um, and as entrepreneurs, they may also face barriers such as uh, more difficulty to access finance uh, and um, representation in smaller firms that generally trade less uh, internationally. Uh, and this, of course, then reflects upon their position when we implement uh, trade policy. Um, uh, but it is very uh, specific to uh, a country, uh, a sector, and also the education level of uh, women and women in specific roles, as I just mentioned, their consumer as an entrepreneur or as an employee. Um, and we also, so I think in also in the specific context now of uh, COVID-19, we have also seen that uh, the economic and socioeconomic effects uh, are disproportionately uh, facing women. And in that uh, context, trade can also um, foster uh, uh, or help to rebuild our economies and foster sustainable uh, economic development. But we need to, again, then uh, look at this uh, in a uh, specific manner and make sure that we uh, have inclusive and uh, ecologically sound trade policies. Um, meaning looking again at women and in these different roles. So to ensure that as employees, they may benefit uh, from new opportunities, as entrepreneurs, they benefit from new opportunities, that we promote decent working conditions, uh, and that they have a role in uh, negotiating and also in the implementation of uh, trade policies. Um, and I dare to say that uh, the Netherlands has been one of the proponents of this uh, trade uh, agenda that is sensitive towards gender issues. Um, meaning that we have uh, indeed, as you just mentioned before, um, called for the European Commission and, and supported the Com European Commission in its efforts uh, to uh, put this uh, on the agenda. Uh, and first and foremost, I think it starts with then uh, doing very decent and, and rigorous uh, gender analysis uh, and impact assessments, because if we want to be sensitive to those gender issues, we need to know what they are specifically in the context of each country, uh, different sectors, uh, and different education level of women. Um, so maybe let me leave it at that and also uh, give the others some uh, space to respond, but I'll happily elabor elaborate a bit more on that, how exactly we would like to address this and uh, what the Netherlands um, has done. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. So Susan? Thank you very much. So I will, uh, that was a wonderful um, summary by Maya. So I'm going to look at three slightly different issues and it's around this. I was really attracted to this idea of why a trade folk that I meet so wedded to the idea that their expertise is gender neutral and they're really offended by any other suggestion that it is a technical expert piece of work that they do. Um, even as quite generalist diplomats. So I've, I've had a, a bit of a think about this and based on a lot of my discussions um, with trade negotiators over the year and trade policy people, I think there's, there's three different reasons. So first of all, I think the DNA of trade has completely changed really radically over the past sort of 20 years. So we were thinking about negotiations over tariffs for particular sectors and particular types of goods that were made in a country and we have fundamentally changed the DNA of trade so that trade is now about services and behind the border reforms and about global value chains um, and uh, really there is a 
wide range of non-economic reasons why one engages in a free trade agreement negotiation, for example. So I, I find this most beautifully put by Nancy Pelosi. I'll just stick it in the chat. There's this great quote um, where she basically says, uh, uh, in order to succeed in the global economy, it's not about protectionism versus free trade anymore. Uh, today, where national markets are being transformed into global networks of finance, production and distribution, and, and I would also add services. Uh, so markets for goods, money, labour services are integrating across borders without beyond the reach of national legislative bodies. So her concern was that essentially trade is becoming an undemocratic exercise. Um, and I think that's one reason why you get the gender blind spot, because it is not as responsive as it should be to national parliaments um, and national policy. So you get this kind of um, club diplomacy, secret elite negotiation styles. And I mean, it's particularly terrible in Australia where you don't even get to see what we've signed up for until after Australia has signed and then it is tabled in parliament. So for me to find out what's happening with the Australia-EU uh, free trade agreement, I actually have to go to the European Union website to find out what the, what the latest negotiations are saying. You can't find that anywhere uh, in Australia unless you're one of the sectors that's being represented. That's my next point, which is that countries don't actually trade with each other other than public procurement. What they do is set the rules for how their, their businesses and uh, their sectors and their people will trade with each other. Businesses trade with each other. States set rules about how they will do that, right? So, so there's the kind of a, a, um, a much deeper relationship in economic diplomacy with the business sector and the business sector in most of our nations, are, and particularly those nations that are export, those businesses that are export oriented, are dominated by, by men very specifically. Um, so if you think about the strongest um, trade actor in Europe, they are agricultural uh, industries. If you think about our strongest trade actors, they are by far the extractive industries and mining companies. Uh, so... So there's power dynamics that are going on that are beyond the level of the state in trade policy. That's, that's why I think there's certain blind spots. And then the, the third reason I think is because of the ongoing colonial legacy um, that trade is really in the middle of. So um, it's partly about the, the failure of the Doha round, but it's still about trade being seen as a manifestation of uh, a post-colonial legacy and this is I think particularly relevant to Europe so I think that you can see all these dynamics playing out in the appointment of the um, the new director general for the WTO which is the first woman um, and the first African um, Ngozi um, gosh, gosh I always get a last name wrong let me make sure I get this completely perfectly right uh Ngozi Akonja Awila, who's a very formidable uh, woman, who's just written a great book with our former Prime Minister Julie Gillard, actually, on women and leadership. So a very strong feminist uh, and someone who's got a very clear view around um, north-south north power dynamics, let's put it that way. So I think if you think about trade policy as kind of this interesting uh, layered cake <laughs> when it comes to diplomatic terms in diplomatic style, content, domestic actors, and um, the kind of the legacy of, of trade as, a, as a, a, a very hot centerpiece of debate between the third world and the first world. That's why I think you get these particular blind spots. I'll talk a little bit more about the particular blind spots I see around human rights uh, later on. Gladly. So, uh, Thank you very much for having me here. It's, it's a real privilege. Um, so just for clarity, I'm uh, doing a research project, as you've said, Paula, with um, Dr. Aaron Hanna and Dr. Adrian Roberts on how gender and trade is spreading as a global policy norm. So I won't co co come to the question from this global perspective, but I will touch on, on many things that have already said, hopefully augmenting the debate. So I'm going to start by um, just highlighting that feminist economists have pointed out for many years that trade liberalization affects women differently than men. Um, in developing countries in particular, but not only, trade liberalization tends to draw women into the labor force, but it also tends to increase the gender wage gap. 
And very often this is the case because of the type of employment that is created for women. Um, for example, in export processing zones or other low manufacturing um, areas, which may well be part of global value chains to, to echo what, what Susan has said. So it's these types of insights uh, provided by feminist economists that have been around for a long time that I think have several layers of blind spots when we look at how this echoes in the global trade governance community, right? So we see, or I see when I go and I speak to people in Geneva and elsewhere, um, and colleagues have already mentioned it, there are many trade policy experts who, who will focus uniquely on the employment creation side of these studies, right? And just see this as the, a kind of success story in a way. Then there are people who will acknowledge the gender wage gap as a problem and who may even go further and add that jobs are being created for women and other vulnerable populations that are precarious, come with poor labor conditions or could even be outright dangerous. Um, so where your export processing zone basically it is a sweatshop in the most extreme example. And then that's kind of a second layer of people. And then you get, maybe these are just the crazy academics, I don't know. <laughs> um, those who say that actually we also need to turn our lens to the social reproductive duties that women carry um, and how this is affected by trade policy. And actually I will correct myself because Maya has already spoken about consumers. So I'm really glad that it's not just the crazy <laughs> academics who say this, but also you know, within policy, there are some people who, have, um, who are acknowledging this. But just to add on to kind of maybe the idea of the, of the consumer, um, again, and this is an extreme case, but I kind of want to augment the debate here. There are some studies that suggest that if we come back to this idea of women gain employment under trade liberalization, and in the worst case scenario, this might be a sweatshop, but the, the plight of that woman might go further um, because she may have been forced into this work by patriarchal family structures, and that in some cases there's documented evidence that these women may not even have control over their income when they bring it home and generally they remain responsible for household and care tasks on top of this type of employment. So if you take this kind of broad lens um, then this claim that women's employment through trade is a, is a kind of a victory is empowering for women starts to look really very strange at best. So um, just very briefly so my kind of experience is that I think what was said by Susan, kind of why do people not understand or, or why we do see um, a, a, a solid group of people that don't really see gender as an issue for trade. What Susan said is, is absolutely um, right and I found it very illuminating. And my experiences as well that those are then also the people who focus on the employment side and say, you know, and I think actually, I'm sorry to quote him, but I think Richard Baldwin has actually said this, you know, women gain employment, what's not to like? And it's just from a feminist perspective, not good enough kind of story. The other problem though, is if we do acknowledge that the conversation around trade and gender necessarily must include a conversation around labor, then we have another really big issue and a political issue, which is that we've sort of settled the conversation around trade and labor in the late 90s, early 2000s. And we've sort of said, well, you know, aside from maybe some social kind of sustainability chapters, we're not gonna do labor and trade, we'll do labor at the ILO. But for a feminist, that's a huge issue because it's all about labor, right? Um, so I'm going to pause at that and I'm going to come back to some of my other uh, blind spots later on. No, thank, uh, thank you very much for this first kind of um, overview of the, the issues, problems kind of uh, that, we, um, that we are facing. And I wanted maybe now to, to turn a bit uh, the focus to the European Union concretely as an actor and uh, maybe ask about what uh, what kind of, uh, whether there is anything that makes the European Union a special actor in the context of uh, its potential maybe for, um, uh, for implementing some uh, feminist trade policy, uh, whether in a way there is a reason why uh, the Netherlands is uh, pushing for um, inclusion of uh, gender issues in trade review at the EU level, or whether it's just purely about the fact that the EU has an exclusive trade competence and that's it kind of. Um, and how, 
legitimate of an actor can the EU be in the global arena and especially vis-a-vis -vis developing countries? And I, and I don't know, you don't all have to respond to that part, but I was also lately reflecting in the context of, uh, of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that I think it has shown how deeply the EU is committed to, uh, to trade liberalization, that it's possibly in the global arena one of the most committed actors to kind of free trade, because what we have seen with the vaccine production and vaccine exports is that the US or the UK have uh, intervened a lot more strongly in the production of the vaccines, have managed to basically block exports of the vaccines produced on their territories, whereas the EU seems to be the beacon of uh, commitments to trade liberalization still in uh, relative uh, terms here. And uh, I wonder whether this deeply embedded commitment to free trade in the EU's DNA in a way to uh, uh, is something that makes it more or less likely to um, to uh, be more of a feminist actor in the global trade policies. So uh, again, uh, I know it's a very broad set of questions, but <laughs> pick and choose a bit. So maybe we start with Maya again. Sure, thank you. Um, well, uh, I think I, we just spoke about, or uh, I tried to highlight also that basically um, trade opportunities uh, aren't necessarily uh, to the advance of women, so that uh, they may struggle to obtain the benefits. Um, and as I said, this depends a lot per country and per uh, sector and education level. Um, and if we ask ourselves, what are the drivers of that? Um, I would say that there are, uh, for example, they could be due to representation of women in, in specific sectors uh, that are different from those of men. Um, and the reason for that, uh, why, why men and women are represented differently across sectors, they are very uh, deeply underlying issues. They are uh, sociological uh, reasons and cultural reasons. Um, and they are also related to domestic policies. Um, and in the Netherlands, for example, we can see that. We, we, could, we can witness that, uh, for example, uh, well, overall participation of women in the private sector is about 40%, but then in retail, there's a lot of, uh, relatively a lot of women, over half are women. Uh, but in wholesale trade, there are uh, only 37%. Uh, and they are very much represented then in uh, cosmetics, in perfume, in uh, clothing, uh, in pharmaceuticals, uh, whereas men, for example, are more represented in uh, machinery and ICT. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, trade policy might influence uh, the opportunities that men and women have depending on their distribution in those sectors. Uh, in the Netherlands, also, the, the, the wage gap between men and women is well, fairly big. Uh, when it was International Women's Day, I think there were some headlines on the newspapers uh, reflecting on the position of the Netherlands in comparison to other EU countries even. Uh, well, is this a reason for the Netherlands not to push uh, in the context of the EU or for the EU not to push for this topic internationally? I don't think so. Because as I said, the, the underlying reasons are uh, socio-cultural, and they, those changing those things requires a lot of time. So we cannot wait and sit back to first have things uh, perfect here in order to push for an agenda internationally then. I think uh, it is legitimate to already move forward, uh, put the issue on the table um, and then uh, see how what we can learn uh, and what the different angles are uh, for different countries. What it means here, what it might may, may mean elsewhere. Um, and well, if you look at the uh, international arena, the, you refer to uh, the, the Dutch position within the EU. Of course, it is the EU who is negotiating on behalf of all the member states. Um, so uh, the EU uh, in that international arena, I think, has quite a lot of uh, influence, as you said, in the WTO but also in bilateral uh, agreements, there might be more room to address this issue. Um, 
simply because the EU is quite a large trading partner, a very large, one of the lar largest internal market. Uh, so where we can uh, indeed negotiate about access of goods, services, uh, and uh, other um, uh, terms of trade, as you mentioned, Susan, it's mainly about the terms of trade that we negotiate now. Uh, there's also uh, some room to uh, put uh, issues that relate to this uh, at the table, uh, such as, uh, well, sustainable development and uh, gender equality, booming economic empowerment. Um, yeah, let me maybe finish there. No, very, I saw both Suzanne and Silke grab their notepads uh, as you were talking, so I think that <laughs> there might be some reactions, so maybe Suzanne. Oh, no, it's, it, no, I think that was an excellent summary. It's just very interesting to me. I don't, I don't actually, I, I was very, very lucky to go to an EU and um, the first EU gender and trade conference in Brussels a couple of years ago that was hosted by Cecilia Maelstrom. And it was a really groundbreaking and fascinating um, experience. Um, and I was chairing a panel which was thinking about um, basically conditionality what kind of gender conditionality should the EU uh, be thinking about in terms of its trade agreements? And it was fascinating because there was a whole lot of people there who were from the development side who were used to very high levels of conditionality in European aid um, and aid for trade. Um, so the idea that Europe's very comfortable with various types of human rights conditionality in the, official, the provision of official development assistance to other countries. Uh, but very shy about human rights conditionality in its trade uh, agreements. And that's, but very pushy about other types of standards. So privacy, data regulation and environmental standards are prosecuted with vigour. <laughs> uh, and if you, if you would ask me what the perception is of the EU in Asia, um, I, would, I would say uh, outside Singapore and Japan, who I think are very comfortable with the European Union's way of trading uh, I would say that most trade policy issues inside Asia are really thought about much more from a geostrategic competition lens. So really the preoccupation of Asia when it comes to trade is to try to weave China into the region as a rules-based actor um, and, to, and also to, um, to weave uh, especially Southeast Asian nations together and so when, when you're looking at trade negotiations, um, especially say the Regional Comprehensive uh, Economic Partnership, RCEP, or, or, or even the Trade Pacific Partnership, there's this concept that it's more about establishing a rules-based order than any particular economic advantage. So um, the European Union often is quite bemused, I think, by the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership in particular, because it's not very focused. There's no real winners, no obvious winners. Um, you would think the strongest actors in that agreement would, would have better outcomes. But actually, that's not what RCEP is about. RCEP is about strengthening the ties between the Asian community. Um, and it also isn't about standard setting. So most European trade preoccupations are about standard setting. And I do think this risks the perception of, you know, the, the, the very sensitive preoccupation of uh, those of us in the Asia-Pacific region is that we've been rule takers, not rule makers for most of the history of modern trade. And so it's this idea that we, uh, as Asia Pacific rises in power, we would like to become rule makers. <laughs> uh, and so I think preoccupation with standards is perceived differently outside Europe than I think Europe thinks it is. It is seen as a, a way that rule makers um, force other countries to um, as the asymmetric lesser of the partnership to, to, uh, to basically change their internal systems, their domestic laws. So here's where I think this is important. From uh, Some of that's fair, some of that's not. I mean, I'm, I'm quite, um, I don't want Europe to stop uh, defending environmental standards in its trade agreements. That's not what I'm getting at, but I'm just telling you it's perceived differently than you, I think you might understand. Yeah, um, <laughs> I was quite shocked at the Brussels forum. They're not listening to what the Asian diplomats are telling them. 
um, I think. Anyway, uh, so uh, one of the issues for me, of course, is the, about this sort of tone deafness around human rights. So for me, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is very nerve-wracking in the sense of there was no gender analysis, there was no human rights analysis, and yet it's a very far-reaching standard-setting agreement. Um, and uh, I'm just going to put another uh, quote here. This is time. It's from 10 Human Rights Council mandate holders in 2015 who basically said trade and investment agreements ha are having an adverse effect on human rights. Um, particularly the TPP. So the protection uh, by lowering the threshold of domestic health protection, food safety and labour standards, as we've heard so much about, but I actually think health, um, health protection and, and standards is increasingly being revealed by vaccine nationalism issues that have beset the new WTO Director General as soon as she's taken the mantle. Um, and especially catering to the business interests of pharmaceutical monopolies, for example. So this, this area of intellectual property and trade agreements is a really important area for us to think about when it comes to, to gender. So I think the literature, especially the IPE literature, has done such a fantastic job in thinking about women's rights to decent work, in thinking about the way tariff reductions affect the domestic resource base of a state to invest in public goods, uh, in thinking about um, the way women workers are themselves um, trapped in various low quality uh, sectors, all that kind of work, but we haven't yet grappled with the, some of these far reaching standard setting issues and with uh, dispute resolution problem. Um, and it's, been interesting to see the way the EU has, has turned its back on ISDS provisions and arbitration of those those standards. But I, I think I think generally trade policy is being seen more and more as a human rights violating mechanism. And so this is something I think for the next generation of trade negotiators to have to understand if if you can't prove a trade agreement is rights compliant, uh, and it will undermine your other advocacy around development and human rights. And there is no way generally at the moment that there's a decent due diligence process about the impact on human rights of most of these trade agreements, particularly not the big plurilateral agreements. In the free trade agreements, you've got a better chance of doing a decent human rights and gender assessment. But if you'll see from UNCTAD, they're saying, oh, women, we don't have enough decent gender data to tell you what the link is. So what we think um, is that it's generally speaking an amplification of existing inequality. Uh, and, and certainly in certain places, you can prove that. You know, think in Cambodia, Vietnam, and other places where there's been really deep analysis. Uh, but we actually don't have the data that we need to be able to make some of these really good um, judgments on the Sun, I think that your uh, audio is freezing for a moment. If, uh... I think that we are having some slight connection issues if you, uh, uh, because like it's, uh, it's fine, but like maybe if uh, you have that I kind of cut you off for the moment and we circle back to this in a month, maybe this also gets yeah. better in a minute. Uh, <laughs> apology. <laughs> but maybe I will move to Silke now. Yeah, thank you very much. I was sitting here and Susan was talking about perceptions and how the EU thinks it's perceived and how it is perceived from the outside. And I was sitting here tempted to make a remark and I will now because we're here for a frank discussion. So I should fully disclose, I'm an EU citizen. I'm a German citizen. I used to work at the University of Helsinki and I would have probably a couple of years ago, you know, kind of confirmed this view of the EU as a, as a free trading power. But it's very uh, striking for me, I've learned this through participating in the workshop, that the discourse around vaccines in the EU is that the EU is the free trader and the US and the UK are sort of, uh, you know, kind of manipulate, manipulating supply. 
I'm here in the UK now and I'm getting the exact opposite. So I think there's, I don't know, I'm just seeing a whole new research project because I would have just following the, what we get on the BBC would have said the opposite. The EU wants to put in an export ban and the Brits were great to make all these contracts early. And it's, it's I mean, but that tells you a lot about trade policy in the first place. Um, but it actually leads on to um, what I wanted to say to the question. So I had a very interesting interview a couple of years ago with a lady who uh, was a former trade negotiator for Canada at the WTO and who then worked for a Canadian business association and she said very candidly to me in the interview you know let's 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 be frank here it's not about free trade it's about managed trade because every government in one way or another manages their trade relations right and so then I think you know we can frame the question as well you know how does how does the EU sort of manage this um, from a feminist or gender perspective? And as you've said, um, Paula, in your opening remarks, at the moment, a lot of it at the EU level is kicked back to kicked back to global governance, right? So uh, the, the EU document talks about um, initiatives in Geneva, whether it's the WTO and ITC has certain gender and trade initiatives. Um, we obviously have member states that are a lot more proactive and the Netherlands is a prime example, but the EU itself, from, from my observations in Geneva, is not a proactive um, state in the, in the gender and trade realm. Um, the other observation I want to make about kind of what kind of an actor is the EU in the global trade arena, it, um, it speaks to one of the questions we've had on the chat about um, w, the WTO politics of this, right? So, so as far as I see it, the, the EU very much follows the lead of countries such as Canada, Iceland, um, and, and some of its own member states in the, in the trade and gender realm. Um, now, when it comes to the MC11 um, WTO Declaration on Trade and Women's Economic Empowerment, there is an interesting friction happening at the WTO right now, where you have 118 members who support it, and then you have a range of members who oppose it, and also civil society groups, many of which include women's groups that oppose it. Um, and, I, and my reading of this is, um, what's unfortunately happened in Geneva is that the, the kind of debate around feminist trade and, and the role of women in trade has been absorbed by the broader political frictions around what the WTO should do and how. So uh, in conversations, for example, with Canadian um, you know, negotiators who work on gender and trade issues, we're, we're often told in order to improve women's position in, in trade and address all these issues that my colleagues have raised previously, we need to work on e-commerce, we need to work on small and medium-sized enterprises, we, we need to work on investment facilitation perhaps, and lo and behold, these are the issues that these countries want to engage in anyway, right? If you speak to representatives from India, South Africa, they make the point to say, well, look, millions and millions of women across the world are small-scale subsistence farmers. So if we want to improve the position of women in global trade, we need to deliver on the promises of the Doha um, mandate that's been kind of abandoned in effect, I suppose. Although I shouldn't have said this because I'm going to have a three hour <laughs> debate around that. But, you know, so so what and, and I think from a sort of just feminist perspective, both of these things are true, but there is a standoff now in Geneva around kind of who should be heading and so fundamentally, which women are we managing global trade for? Um, yeah, so I think I will leave it at that because that then leads us on to the next question, doesn't it? So kind of, so what does that mean then in feminist trade politics and um, that may help women everywhere and, and what do we need to do to implement it? Exactly, like this is, uh, uh, this I think we are already, moving into that and thanks also for integrating the questions from the audience indeed about the, the question whether the WTO system is not a major roadblock in, uh, in implementing such policies. Because I wanted now to ask you in general indeed what, what, would, uh, what, would, it, what would you see as key changes that to make uh, in the EU's or in the global trade policy to make it more feminist. So, uh, uh, 
what would a more feminist trade policy look like? So, uh, and whether we can bridge this gap that I also mentioned at the beginning in a way between uh, on the one hand, uh, the discussions about uh, more involvement of uh, women in uh, in trade that, that seem to have a momentum overall indeed. And on the other hand, the discussions about also uh, uh, the kind of deeper understandings of uh, not only in a way paying lip service to involving women in decision making, uh, but rather actually looking at the structural effects um, that uh, we see basically in other fields than trade, maybe a lot more also in development policy, as Susan uh, mentioned, especially in the EU context, that uh, those debates are rather happening there and not that much in the trade policy context. Uh, so maybe a bit. Um, looking ahead what kind of um, changes could be um, could be made maybe Maya again um sure well um maybe let me start with the the trade policy review communication um you've referenced to the to the input that we've given and silke i think you also no well paula first you also mentioned of course what is in there uh, and I think overall, uh, we would, from a Dutch perspective, we're of course very happy that um, with the trade policy review communication in general, uh, and also with the mentioning of uh, gender issues. Uh, in addition to what you mentioned, there is a gen there's a reference to the gender strategy, um, where there's some additional points, a little bit more specific in, in addition to what you were saying, I think there's mention of including provisions uh, with reference to certain uh, international agreements uh, that are relevant to gender equality. Uh, I think we would have um, uh, expected uh, there to be a, lit, a bit more emphasis on this topic and a bit more uh, substance also in the communication itself, rather than just uh, the reference to this gender strategy. Um, so it's the gender action plan and then the, uh, the third one, I think, that came out uh, end of last year that I'm referring to. Um, and um, well, uh, as I said before, oh, and then I wanted to mention that- uh, Thank you, I was formulating my questions in a bit provocative way initially to say that indeed the commission is just paying lip service. So thanks for, it was to provoke more explanations from you. <laughs> no, well, I mean, I think it is fair to say that as we've pushed for this topic uh, quite a lot, uh, we would have wished it to be um, a bit more central to the agenda. But, uh, but of course the EU is taking this uh, this uh, point forward and we support it continuing that also in the context of the WTO uh, and I would say Silke if your uh, analysis is that the EU is not very much at the forefront of this I would say that that is uh, somewhat worrying maybe because it I would, would it should be um, but uh, as you've also pointed out fairly I think uh, it, it, it will it is and it remains a challenge to put this on the agenda because although we have uh, what is it 127 signatories to the Buenos Aires Declaration uh, well frankly speaking not all of those signatories might be um, uh, as eager to now push that agenda forward but we can have to keep that momentum going uh, and so I think uh, work remains to be done in, uh, on, well, defining what, uh, from the perspective of those members of the WTO, is of interest now, and what does it really mean um, to put uh, women, economic empowerment, gender is not mentioned really in that declaration, right, um, on the WTO agenda. Uh, and I think that continues to be also uh, conducting gender impact assessments, uh, just because uh, we still lack data, we still lack analysis, uh, and it also remains a awareness raising uh, project, so to say, to identify, as I said, what are the interests. And if it is not of the interests of the members of the WTO, then, well, it is a member driven organization. So, yeah, it needs to be of their interest. Otherwise, uh, uh, well, it might risk falling off the table. 
Uh, and then, of course, in bilateral agreements, as I pointed out before, there's a bit more room for the EU to also uh, include additional issues. Uh, maybe referencing a bit to what uh, Silke and uh, Susan, you've mentioned before, I think, uh, Silke, you mentioned uh, labor issues and, and Susan also human rights issues. They are uh, relevant topics to include, and I think we see that they are included in the uh, EU's trade policy agenda. But I think it is also uh, fair to say that uh, trade policy can only do as much. Um, there are, as you said, Susan, we are negotiating the trade, the terms of trade. Um, and there is, of course, a certain, uh, well, balance to be found in the different uh, topics that we're advancing on. Um, so where that balance will, what that balance, the outcomes of that, that uh, process might be is also, of course, uh, depending on the counterpart that the EU is negotiating with. Um, and I think we, as the Netherlands, uh, are, would be um, very much for including um, well, as we've outlined in the non-paper that we you've referred to before, uh, several points of um, uh, provisions that uh, can uh, serve as a, as a starting point to cooperate on various issues relating to gender equality and women's economic empowerment, um, uh, so that we can basically use our bilateral trade agreements as a leverage to obtain that long-term process of change that I referred to beforehand. Um, but yeah, I so I think you can use them as a leverage and we should, uh, but uh, also a little point of caution there in that, yeah, these are long-term processes and um, well, <laughs> it might not always be easy to, to put that forward. No, and uh, thank you for raising also indeed the more kind of pragmatic point that I don't know, maybe we might be um, overburdening trade policy or that maybe the kind of expansion that is happening in a way anyway of the trade policy goals might kind of, again, lead to more politicization of it, might lead to more backlash um, against it in certain uh, contexts. So whether um, um, questioning also like how much we should manage our expectations with regard to what can be done through trade policy. But I, I would uh, maybe then uh, uh, let Suzanne <laughs> take the word again. Sure. I mean, I really agree with that. We can't enforce most, I mean, the trade enforcement mechanisms we have are so broken. Um, so one of the things I think is really important is that the dispute mechanisms uh, for free trade agreements have a better balance of male and female mediators. It's truly terrible. The, the lists of dispute resolution, um, it's, it's shocking actually. There's, I think there's like two women on it out of hundreds. So there's, there's, a, there's just some clear structural bias issue happening for the mediation list. Uh, and um, I suppose for me, uh, the question for me is, should we allow trade to keep intruding into domestic human rights issues with, by stealth, I suppose, because I don't think most citizens really understand what, what the next generation of trade looks like. So I guess the answer to me is much more transparency and communication about what trade agreements actually say and do um, and that all the criteria around trade is usually about increased GDP which I think is the wrong measure uh, so I think that we should be looking at all the different impacts trade agreements have and that simple job uh, increases in jobs or increases in the productivity of sectors or overall GDP increase which is all uh, all you seem to get so we've just done a long-term analysis of the Australia-US free trade agreement. And actually it's pretty fuzzy economics, I must say. It's not really clear that that has been an economic agreement in that sense, uh, might play a range of other purposes, but 
the actual claims that were made for that, that agreement and what it's actually delivered are very different. And there's not a lot of scrutiny around that anyway. So even on just economic terms, there's not a lot of clarity about the financial benefits some of those agreements bring us. And think of the amount of work that go into the diplomatic work that go into those agreements. Years and years and years, hundreds and hundreds of people. And the benefits of them are not being properly communicated or quantified to the public that they're meant to be serving. So I think we need to have a, a really good look at the democratic process around trade agreements and the evaluation of what they mean. And I think that's the next wave of what's coming to, to trade. So um, instead of the stakeholders, I think will widen, especially in the health field. Thank you. And Silke? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. So, um, I mean, on this question, what would a global kind of feminist trade politics look like? I've, of course, published an article with um, Aaron Hanna and Adrian Roberts on this, which Susan has kindly shared. Um, so I'm not going to kind of, you know, <laughs> go through the arguments in detail, but I will actually kind of give my reaction based on this uh, work that I've previously done to the EU's open, sustainable and assertive trade policy document as I was reading it. So um, as Paula pointed out, and, and others have also raised that there's a, a lot of talk here about collection of sex and gender disaggregated data. And just from the, the research that we've done and the work that we've done, we want to point out that it's absolutely essential here that we um, do not only focus on economic data narrowly conceived, but that we take into account count the real life worlds of women and ultimately the kind of the point about social reproduction that I made earlier. Again, feminist economists have developed ways of enhancing CGE analysis and CGE modeling but by what they call um, social accountability matrices. So that includes um, kind of methods of accounting for social reproductive labor, even leisure time in certain instances, and kind of modeling this to forecast the impacts of a trade agreement. So we have argued, and I would argue that at a minimum, we need this type of uh, social accountability modeling included in CGE if we really want to understand the impacts um, and kind of the data that's out there. But what I would also add is that actually uh, we need qualitative data collection methods as well, where um, because at times I can sit, you know, in my ivory tower of maybe an academic institution or also a trade policy institution and try and imagine what the impacts of trade policy would be, but it's not necessarily what people tell me on the ground. So we are very much in favor of, um, you know, when we gather the impacts. Um, that we talk to women's organizations that work on trade and gender issues. Um, and it's important not to narrow this down to women's organizations who might be active in kind of business um, or entrepreneurship, but also to include those kinds of critical organizations that I mentioned earlier, uh, who are maybe critical of the WTO declaration. Um, and just to understand where, where they're coming from and what the points are that they're making. Um, the, the EU document speaks about plurilateralism as the route for unlocking WTO politics. And I have to say, prior to this project, I did a project where I spoke to um, trade policy officials in kind of what were then the key member states of the WTO as the Doha round was still being battled over. So it was US, Canada, EU, but also India, South Africa, Brazil. Um, and I really, personally do not think that plurilateralism is the route for unlocking WTO politics. I have, I was told based on my conversations with, um, you know, people in, in the capitals, I mentioned that this will further alienate countries that are still holding out for the developmental promises of the Doha Rand to be fulfilled. Um, and, and in the process, also realistically might leave aside many women across the world who are small subsistence farmers or for example who you know have problems that relate to IP um, kind of rules and trade agreements Susan spoke about that earlier on so yeah is the WTO a roadblock yes and no I, I mean <laughs> If we can solve the WTO, we can solve this at the WTO, but I think um, we have to be very careful 
of what kind of multilateralism you know we're striving for do we strive for the one that gives us the trade rules that we want in the powerful capitals or do we strive for the one that's genuinely inclusive um of of the global community the latter might include sort of dialing back our ambitions of the new rules that we get and that's often what capitals don't want but the interesting and i'm just kind of going off script here <laughs> and telling a few anecdotal stories one of the interesting interviews i did um was actually with the business association in geneva where the representative told me i like 80 percent of my job is explaining to my member organization so the businesses that are members of this uh, of this kind of rep business representation why we need to take our time and why multilateralism is important in the long term for a, a rules-based trading system for a stable global trading system and why we shouldn't always just just push for a quick example so I found that really interesting and um, this kind of tension between the short term, long term outcomes of, of trade policy. Um, so I will then finish on another point, which is I think the EU needs to take into account the sphere of social reproduction a, a lot more broadly and adjust its own trade policies accordingly. I'm going to do another shameless self-promotion and say we have an article coming out in, in the review of international political economy uh, shortly. I'm happy to share it if anybody wants to uh, look at it now. Um, uh, one of the things we look at in this article is um, Chilean FTAs with other Latin American countries that have very progressive gender chapters and that actually go very far in, in how we can imagine it might look like to include social reproduction in trade agreement, also bringing in certain ILO conventions, for example, on equal pay or on workers with family responsibilities, talking about social security, et cetera, et cetera. So what then for me is, because so Chile is, is the country that has these very progressive gender chapters in agreements with Argentina and Uruguay. At the moment, the EU is is negotiating with Chile and there is a proposed text on gender but it actually mirrors the Canadian model for gender um, chapters which is a lot more regressive. So I would say on my wish list is if you're negotiating with Chile take the Chilean approach um, it would be a really easy thing to do, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no. Well, I'm sure it wouldn't be. But, uh, you know, this is just one example of something that's mm -hmm. maybe quite tangible. Um, but also then the EU needs to recognize the impact of trade policies on women in the EU. And here, something that we haven't really talked about that I want to bring into the conversation is um, the effects of service liberalization and investment protection on um on women in their social reproductive roles, particularly clauses that affect public and essential services. So I very much welcome the EU's assertion that it wouldn't commence FTA talks with the US unless health was off the table from the start. I don't know if that still stands, but I read about that a while ago and I thought that's exactly what we need. Um, I think we also have to take effective public service carve-outs. Um, that go beyond standard GATS Article 14 that, that are you know, more effective in terms of securing the policy space of governments. Um, we need to consider standstill and ratchet clauses as far as in service liberalization as far as they concern public and essential services. Um, and we need effective protective mechanisms for public policy under investment protection also. Um, Finally, and I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> this is my last point. I really do think that in order in order to bring all these things about, what the EU has to do is 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 have a more effective way of genuinely affording uh, women's organizations participation in the trade policy process. And I would echo Susan here. <laughs> you know. I, if that's what she meant, I'm just going to make an interpretation of it. A lot of trade policy is about perception. A lot, it's a lot more about perception than we often kind of admit, I think. And if trade policy is perceived as this human rights violating mechanism, I think that's what you said, Susan, then there can be benefits economically here and there. It doesn't really matter, right? So I think we need to really um, understand where these concerns come from, understand the kind of the actual mechanisms that bring them about and then try and tackle them in trade policy. I do, I do hear the argument that trade policy can't fix everything. I do hear that. But if trade policy affects so many areas, it's we still need to do something about it in one way, shape or form. Mm 
thank no, you. Thanks. Thank you very much. I mean, we are kind of uh, um, nearing the end of our time. So I think Silke basically also integrated her uh, concluding statements in this last statement. So I will maybe just also give a chance to Maya and Susan to briefly kind of uh, articulate their uh, last statements. And I, I do think that those are in a way the limits of the roundtable format that we touch up on a lot of issues, but we don't uh, get to really kind of uh, discuss them out in detail. And uh, so maybe then uh, Maya, I also wanted to uh, give you the last, uh, the moment for the last words and ask you a bit. So in the questions we had the issue of maybe the WTO limits being raised as a problem in EU negotiations about uh, including gender um, issues in trade policy, whether there were any other factors that were raised as kind of limits or arguments against uh, this in the internal EU debates, whether you can eliminate on that, but otherwise also <laughs> your final statements. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, um, I don't think within the EU, I've not uh, really come across much opposition to this uh, this point. Uh, I think also the quite broad support for our non-paper from nine other member states shows that there is a willingness to work on this, uh, luckily, happily. Um, uh, so yeah, no, I think, well, of course, then it re still remains a challenge to uh, to see how exactly you want to incorporate it in bilateral agreements or in the WTO. And as I said before, that is then also the result uh, of the input of uh, other uh, uh, stakeholders or countries. Um, maybe uh, then as a concluding remark, just um, also to get back to the other speakers. Um, I think indeed we've seen that um, on the trade policy agenda there is now a lot of uh, other topics that are of interest to the to the public and political debate um uh, and i personally also work on uh, other uh, non-trade so to say issues uh and i think that there is not only a uh well there's both a, a call from indeed the public the, the the politics the citizens to address these issues and there is a very inherent need uh for, to address not only uh, gender equality issues but also other very pressing uh issues um, um and then well to get back to the point of what is exactly what we're aiming for with trade policy indeed we're aiming for to create this kind of um, stable uh, rules-based environment uh, in which we can trade uh, it's not the only reason why we trade we would also trade uh, without bilateral agreements so in that sense yeah i mean we have to take that into account but and it's very much also about uh, building geopolitical alliances um, and I think uh, it, it suits the EU to then uh, put things such as gender equality and women economic empowerment at the table um, and to include that in its trade policy. And uh, well, that's why I think uh, as the Netherlands, uh, we, we are pushing for this uh, topic to remain on the EU's, EU's agenda. No, oh, thank you very much. I think it's interesting to see that I think that there has been already a significant change in terms of the discourses that on that point, there is a lot more kind of alignment between in a way the academic side and the policy side, but yet kind of on the actual implementation when like in a way the, um, examining the results, there seems to be still kind of more of a um, gap. But uh, turning now to Susan, I think Susan, you were also responding in the chat on different examples regarding the potential to differentiate between uh, tariffs on sustainable and non-sustainable goods or regarding uh, inclusion of women in uh, startups and e-commerce sector. So maybe you also want to mention that in your final statements. Uh, there is a lot of creativity in some of the interventions, especially around uh, including women into value chains and, and supporting, I think still K calls the micro interventions for female entrepreneurs. Uh, I must say in my work at the G20, that's been the only trade issue where any gender issue has had any traction. 
and maybe because it doesn't really threaten the status quo of trade particularly, um, but it's, it's still, in my view, it's still good um, to see for those, for those women to uh, have the attention of their government and their support of their government in their activities is still a good thing. I just wanted to say that the, um, the, the effort to support a rules-based order, I think, is really worthwhile. And I think there is a difference between those who want to see trade policy be, be human rights compliant, demonstrably human rights compliant, and those who are losing faith in trade. Um, and there is certainly so much of that. I mean, to be honest, when you talk to me about um, how is the world thinking about the EU, I thought that the world hasn't been able to take its eyes off the US in terms of trade policy. You know, I think so many of our assumptions have just been rocked to the core about what the major economic actor in our system was willing to destroy um, that it created, you know, uh, that the post-war system is, that was extraordinary. So I think the, uh, the focus has been sort of off every other actor but the US for, for the, the time of the Trump administration. And there'll need to be some rebuilding of faith, I think, from the US administration around trade policy in particular, and you can see that happening already. But I think if those of us in the Asia Pacific region are watching that really closely. Uh, you know, if you can't rely on the US, that is a very massive different calculation for, for those of us in the Asia Pacific um, when it comes to, to thinking about trade policy and the, the ripples of that are, are still working through our, our region and the kinds of calculations the region's doing. So uh, for, for my view, it's really about communicating the benefits of a rules-based trading system more clearly to the public uh, and uh, letting them understand what it, what it means for them and how the system works. I think there's, uh, it's an alienating language. Most of the language around international trade law is very alienating, even for other lawyers. Uh, so I think we need to be much more accessible in the way we explain trade, especially modern trade, um, and the benefits and disadvantages of various aspects of the trading regime. So that, that's how I'll end. Um, and uh, I, I, for me, the most exciting thing is this alignment between ILO conventions uh, and the and the uh, the trade chapters, um, mostly unenforceable trade chapters. But I, I won't go on about that as a lawyer. But um, I, I will say though that uh, one of the issues that's raised in our region a lot is that that's great, but barely anyone will know OECD country has signed the Migrant Workers Convention, and many workers from Asia are migrant workers. Uh, so I think, you know, there's a partiality to the way the international legal regime is, is treated. So I, I, would, I would hope that in time, uh, more Western countries sign the Migrant Workers Convention and, and incorporate some of that into the trade uh, policy background as well. So that's my dream, we'll see what happens. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Uh to uh, Maya, Susan, Silke for a very engaging debate. I think it's, uh, um, as I already flagged, those are the limits of the roundtable debate that we rather uh, mention a lot of issues and uh, only kind of start unpacking them a little bit. So it would definitely, were there, uh, it would, uh, definitely be worth of uh, further academic uh, and policy debates on the more concrete examples and issues. So I hope that there will be chances to follow up on that. In terms of our series on the feminist uh, EU in the world, we have another event coming up in May on uh, peace and security. Um, so the EU more as an actor in security and peacekeeping. So if um, any of you are interested, I'm posting the, the link now uh, uh, in the chat as well. And thank you a lot for listening and engaging in the debate and uh, uh, join me in thanking the speakers. <laughs>